we tend to be so lucky in Zambia and Africa because much of the land that we own, most people just inherit it. You don't buy it. And, and yet you're sitting on this inherited land and, and not making it productive. You know, you can't send your kids to school. You can't have decent housing. You can't actually sustainably feed yourself. And yet you're sitting on this resource. So my focus was how do we turn this resource that we sit in, which we don't even value, into something that we can actually get jobs out of. Welcome to the Harmony of Interest podcast, where we explore ideas shaping our world. My name is Evan Papp, and I'm the executive producer for Empathy Media Lab that publishes content on labor, political economy, art, and culture. And we're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Today, I'm speaking with my friend Conrad Bwalia, who is the owner of Bwando Farms based in Zambia, Africa. Bwando Farms was started in 2015 as a small hobby farm that has been transformed into a successful integrated farming business, while also creating financial opportunities for rural Zambians and by training local farmers and a lot more. So Conrad, so good to see you and thanks so much for your time. <laughs> so good to see you, old friend. Uh, yeah. I'm so excited. So like after like 15 years um, yeah, man. of not uh, of meeting, but uh, good, good. This is so exciting for me. Yeah, man. And I've been following your work through social media and Facebook and those things. And for the audience, they should know that uh, I met you when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia, and uh, you helped lead the way on a lot of trainings. And uh, we were working in a distance education program at that time with the Educational Development Center, EDC is the name of it. And it was a USAID project. And uh, yeah, man, you you really kind of made my experience in Zambia so welcoming. And I just, I was always like very impressed with with your work in, in that sector. And then you kind of shifted to this new thing. So could you begin by just introducing yourself and then we'll get into Bwando Farms. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, man. So my name is Conrad, Conrad Welia. I come from an educational background and entrepreneur, apparently agro business entrepreneur. Of course, what I do today is emanates from the background of the work we did together, the time of Peace School and Education Development Center, the whole aspect of, I think, trying to make a difference in people's lives, people who are not ourselves. You and me at least had an opportunity maybe of attending some level of education. And, and we live in a society where other people didn't have that opportunity and they still have to live. You know, and that's where I derived my strength from. I did do my work for almost 18 years with development aid to about 2015. I chose to actually pursue what I felt was more sustainable because all the time we spoke sustainable development, sustainable development, but I chose also to go sustainable way with my own, I think, career path. And what was that? That was me starting up something that was of my own and agribusiness. So I'm married to Linda. I, I, I hope you still remember Linda. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she, she, she's in the kitchen right now. She turned up here, she's home with a whole gang of kids and we won't be able to start <laughs> talking. <laughs> so That's I awesome. Love, love yeah. yeah. So we, 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 we start trying to do something different. And I think I, I've got great passion for communities and uh, transforming lives. And the exposure of working in a heat agency just made me see probably a lot of and struggle in so many Zambian families. And mostly it's not people finding themselves in situations because they chose to, but just circumstances just couldn't allow. That, that, that gave me the desire of wanting to do it a little bit more, probably this time being in control of, 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 of all this and, and, and. I thought of starting Wando Farms. Uh, Wando comes from just our names as my last name and Dolo is Linda, my wife's last name. And then we just matched that up and we said, we're going to go this together. And I, and I chose to take it up full time. The whole background of working with communities, especially the rural and, and the poor, the children were quite central to everything we did. And most of them were in circumstances that were not of their own making, but then I also had my own lessons in that experience we had working with you guys, because then I was looking at sustainable development and also asking myself how sustainable is what I'm doing today. Probably there'll be a point when 
it will all end. I won't need to get a job anymore. So even what I'm just doing is not even sustainable in itself. So what if I started just something of my own and I would have control and probably I would want to help communities based on what I think is the best for them, not something that is just coming in from, from, from outside. And, and also maybe just having control on how I run the decisions in a local. That is how we set up Wando Farms. The Wando Farms apparently doesn't mean anything in terms of its name. It's just a combination of my name and my wife's name. But in the southern part of the country, the Tongas actually, the name Wando is like the creamy part of the milk, the yellow part when they just eating the cows, that yellow part, which we all love to just sip in our morning teas. So that's what it means. So we set up Wando Farms in 2015. And principally, we, we just started as a, a small crook farm. I just didn't have uh, much ambition or orientation. It, my focus was on what can we do with the communities and maybe try to see how we can make money off the land that mostly we inherit. Apparently, we tend to be so lucky in Zambia and Africa because much of the land that we own, most people just inherit it. You don't buy it. And, and yet you're sitting on this inherited land and, and not making it productive. You know, you can't send your kids to school. You can't have decent housing. You can't actually sustainably feed yourself. And yet you're sitting on this resource. You know, so my focus was how do we turn this resource that we sit in, which we don't even value into something that we can actually get jobs out of, yeah. you know, yeah. so let's take it, let's not have people think jobs are only in town. Look, Zambia and employment record stands at a staggering 68%. Wow, man. And, and people still think there are jobs out there in, in, in town and, and I'll say, no, 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 I think jobs are just where we are. The jobs are just on this inherited two acre piece of land that your grandparents left for you. That's yeah. where the job, that's where the future is. And, and just a little background too, for the audience, Zambia is about the size of Texas and it has one of the lower population densities in the world, actually outside of the cities. And it's very farmland, good weather patterns, a lot of, a lot of green space, at least kind of in that middle to Northern belt. And you're, you're right in the Lusaka Chongwe area. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. Actually the Lusaka Chongwe area which is the predominantly the farming community. Yeah. And uh, so, so I saw this post that, so you started out with this idea of, of trying to figure out how to empower local folks with actual jobs and, and creating value on the land that they own. You also, I, I saw this post on, on Facebook where it's like, you know, you, you remember your humble beginnings as an entrepreneur where you sold greens at different markets and bus stops on your own. The journey hasn't been easy as most would insinuate. Never is an easy road. So when we think about farming, I mean, it's, it's one of the harder jobs, but you, you started off with this concept of, of how you want to help with development and improvement while also creating your own independence. So yeah, what was kind of the next step from there? Yeah. So, you know, we... Apparently in, in Zambia or Africa per se, we kind of try to, 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 to maybe get results in the, in the hurry. And, and that's why even corruption thrives a lot here because I think ingenuity, you know, perseverance and, and, you know, it's, it's not there. At my level, I, I stepped out of a very comfort zone where I worked in aid agency and there was good pay. And, and to imagine me going to sell some greens, there's a bunch of rep yeah. and probably two saints, you know, sitting in a band the whole day and being hit by the scorching sun and I'm meeting all the folks that I worked with. I mean, all the guys that I, I interacted with and, and then they're working with probably their, their spouses in, I mean, in this, you know, comfort. Yes. Right? And then finding me, treading yeah, this. But here's, here's, here's what that all means. First of all, I was pregnant with a vision and, and that vision was just with me. Nobody, nobody knew what's like, what was troubling me in my head. 
Okay. Not even my closest spouse. I think my wife just wondered. And then I think she, I greatly, greatly appreciate them. And then and, she just thank her because she never knew what, that which bothered me in the mind because I saw it and I knew what it was. And, and, and every time I try to labor to explain to people that to see, I'm trying to do something that is actually not like service provision, but creating an industry, like big industry that is going to be quite competitive. And so many people and communities will benefit from it. You know, the more I kept saying it, the more I was getting tired because people that hate me, friends that hate me, folks that hung out with me, the more they, they hated it and they, and they checked where I was trying to do that. There was nothing there. It was like, you said, push. And, and there was not any source of electricity nearby to read. And they were saying, so where are you going to do it from? I said, here. And uh, is it why you stepped out of work so that you can do this? It's like, yeah. So you see, it's kind of like confusing. And, and, and only you who's pregnant with a vision would understand what it is. And that is why risk taking comes in in entrepreneurship. First of all, you start to listen to the inner man, that inner man we all have. You know, it's just that voice that just keeps talking to us, to all of us. I think he spoke to the Zuckerbergs, he spoke to the alien masks, and, and they just believed it, you know, and he just believed it. So the more I, I came to realize, the more you try to justify what the vision is before you start to act, then you might just get tired, you might get discouraged, and might just fall off. So I chose to withdraw a bit and start to deal with myself. Okay. I started to deal with myself. I needed to accept and understand that what I'm hearing within me is true. And I just need to trust it. And, and, and voice also told me it wasn't for my own benefit. It wasn't for me to create an empire. No, it's for the people that I worked with since I was a young person in development aid. You know, it's, it's, it's just a continuation of everything. And probably this is the right time for me now to probably lead it and, and probably try to make decisions that we act people quickly, you know, and in the best way that I saw it fit. And I believe that, and I believe that. So it became so lonely, it became so lonely because first of all, you, you have to accept that you're going to lose a lot of friends. I believe it, it, apparently in my country. You will have from, you'll be a man of so many friends if your pockets are full and you've got money to <laughs> spend out, you know, but I didn't have, because I lost it all. You, you, you have to give so that you can, you can also gain some time. So you invested you know? it all into the business and the farm. Yeah. Yes. I, I, and there wasn't even like, like, like all in the business, there was just an idea. And then the lead we had was this little family savings and there were probably a few properties here and there. But I mean, I had to sell off a car to buy a transformer so that we can connect power to this bush need to bring in power there, you know, and, and, and today I can tell you that now the whole village where the, the businesses are hosted is now connected to the electricity grid because I brought in the first transformer into that area. Now people are about to even top and power is gone. The local clinic has power, you know, awesome. our little which, you know, so it's, 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 it, it emanated from there, but it comes with, with endurance. It comes with a bit of pain and you don't have to be in a hurry. And, and then you have yourself to deal with first before you can start to fix something else. And, and that's what happened. And, and, and my life just got transformed. A lot of things just had to change about, about how I looked at life. You know, I, 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 I had to realize I was now an asset for everybody, not just an asset for myself and my family now. Like I just belong now to everybody, especially the disadvantaged. Yeah. Wow. That is incredible. And, you know, I've, I've a few times in my life, I've taken the unbeaten path and I kind of had a vision in my mind as well. And you end up taking a lot of losses and a lot of L's as they say. And you just got to keep believing that what you're doing is the right path because it's meaningful to you and it's meaningful to you in this larger society of trying to do good and trying to make something better of yourself and of the people around you. Well, also, you know, a lot of people are going to doubt and try to, you know, persuade you from, from moving towards your dreams and it, it can be really challenging. And so it's just, it's beautiful what you've been able to do over the last seven years. So 
Could you talk a little bit about what is Blondo Farms and what, what the model is? Thank you so much. So you can see that the farmer outreach support program, it's the, the two are so embedded into each other. Deliberately, I designed the business so that I would depend on other people and the business are small order farms. Okay. Just to give a bit of background, you, you might want to know that 90% of what is grown and consumed in Zambia is grown by the rural smallholder farmer families and, and these people still live in poverty and yet they produce about 90% of what we consume as a country. So where, where is the problem with that? You know, and, and, and I thought of, you know, we, I would design a business that depends on them and, and, and the survival of Wonder Farm depends on these people, which is a quite a huge risk on our part, because if they fail, it means that I also fail. But in other sense, what this also means is that it gives me a lot of work to make sure that they don't fail. Okay. And the main aims of Wonder Farms is to create opportunities in, in this, uh, their local economies through supply chains. So I have to depend on these people. They have to produce the product that we want, which I will in turn do value addition to. And what are these products? Mostly it's grain products. So we're talking about soybeans, maize, the uh, pigeon pea, uh, sunflower, etc. And these are meant to produce the livestock feed. So why the livestock feed? Like I said, Wonder Farm is situated in a predominantly farming community and, and, and these farmers are producing small livestock like chickens, broilers and layers, also pigs, goats, and a few cattle because Lusaka is not necessarily a cattle uh, town, but then they have to feed the animals, but the problem is the source for the feed, first of all, is far. The distance for them to go get a feed, even just one bag of feed or just uh, half a kilo. They have to cover a long distance and pay a lot on transportation for it. Okay. So I saw an opportunity there. I said, okay, I mean, at the end of the day, you're still farmers and you're struggling to feed these animals. So what if we decide to produce this feed in, in this location where we are, as long as you also promise me that you work on your inherited land to produce the grain that I desire to make the feed, which I'll sell you. And in some cases, if you, depending on the relationships that we create, I will loan you the feed, but I will watch how you produce the livestock and I might participate in where we sell it, meaning I might off take it from you. I, I buy it at an acceptable price and, and I, and I'll do a, a bit of value addition to it. I'll clean it up a bit, put it in up some plastic and I'll take it to uptown market, but I'll make sure that I pay you at the, the price that is acceptable. And we are great. Okay. So. Why doing all that? My aim was to reduce poverty, okay, in your community and, and create a self value among us as farmers, you know, and like I told you earlier, I said, I told the farmers, let's stop looking up to Lusaka. There's nothing there, you know, 68% unemployment and you are in the village. Can you just imagine how much competition is in there? And then two, oh, there's a person like me who is leaving that town coming to stay and work with you in a, in a rural area. Apparently I'll be shifting and starting to live in a village by December, just to lead now with these communities, with my family. Okay. So we're creating self-value. You can see the main objectives that I listed, you know, it's all centered on people that are not ourselves. And then the business has to thrive because of them. They fail, we fail. Okay. What does that entail? Investment into these people. Okay. And what is the investment are we looking at now? It's not financials. It's a mindset change. Okay. It's a mindset change. First, we value that which we have. And what is it? Inherited land. Free. Free of judge. These people have this land. Yeah. I don't have. Okay. I need the hundred hectares to grow soybeans. I don't have hundred hectares. But I'll combine all these small, small pieces of land that these farmers have, and I'll have a hundred big hectares that I require. Then how will they give me the product I want? We have to capacity build them. Okay. And we have to make them now start to uh, realize that small water farming can actually be a business. Yeah. Okay. You can't just produce for your own consumption. No, because there's a lot of things now that we have to pay for. So you will need some form of income coming into your own household. And, and you're going to use your land 
to make that money. Okay, so what are we buying from these farmers? So targeted at rural farmers, we, I ask that they, I, they form or I work with existing structures, that is village cooperatives, okay, which actually I found they had. Okay, so like in the community where I work, there were like three cooperatives. I would name them. We might not understand the names, but I will just name them. <laughs> so it's Chabula, Kalimansenga, and Kalimansenga, and uh, Chikoshi. And, and, and these cooperatives were already there, but were a bit dysfunctional because nobody was working with these communities. They, 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 the cooperative idea came from the books. And, and people still, I mean, they have basic education. They, they just didn't understand how to go about it. They didn't know they can be bankable and things like that. And I brought in that. Okay. My wife is a chartered accountant. We designed some localized training program. And apparently she even had to enroll with a Japanese university in Japan, Japan, supported by JICA, just to learn on how to support smallholder farming as a business. So my wife had to even give in time, stay in the schedules working in the government. And, and she underwent the trainings, which she brought down to the communities. I work, awesome. mostly, I, I work mostly in operations, so I'm kind of like chasing to have the products done. I'm, I'm working with the soils, I'm working with the farmers and, and, and all these things. And, and she brings in the financial and business sense. Okay. So what are we adding value to? So we are the, currently adding value to pork products. So we brought in quite some equipment that is allowing us now to process about 12,000 pigs a year. And, 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 and in terms of production, as Wonder Farm, we can only produce half of that and half has come from the community. So we need the community, meaning the community have good jobs and they've got guaranteed income because investment has come into the village and they have to work to produce that. Okay, we also need to, produce, to, to add value to chicken products. So we're having so many small chicken farmers you know, aggregated together, they have to be supplying us 200 chickens every day for processing. So you can only imagine how many will those be and how busy they will be because we need to process those. Okay. And, and we are producing the feed for the same chickens and the pigs from the grains that they themselves produce. That's awesome. Okay? And, and, and we are sending it back to them in form of stock feed. And going forward, because we need to have quite a product mix, we need to make other products that require us to mix a certain livestock. So we've also asked those that have cattle to also jump, jump, jump on board and, and we move together with them. So ideally the plan is to grow ourselves, to deliver, okay, yeah. the product to the consumer who also should be happy to make sure that we're also giving them that something that is safe and clean for them to eat and, and also to sustain our activities. Okay. So currently our products are in butcheries, they're in chain stores. I don't know. I don't know if you still remember Zambif. Uh, Zambif oh yeah. Big oh, yeah. I remember going to that farm at, during some of our retreats. Yes. So we supply them, currently we supply them a lot of uh, pigs, but now we're going into our own value addition. So yes. the supply chain now might stop because now we want to also they, they, they get into their market share. We want now the consumer to get closer to us and, and start consuming our products as Wando, not uh, coated in a zombie for a brand. And, and hopefully soon we should start to export into, into the, into the region. Yeah. Wow. So when you're exporting, is it, it's all domestic right now in Zambia, Zambia exports outside Zambia, or is it all in internal to Zambia right now? No, Zambia is, is in Nigeria. Yeah. 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 Than West Africa, okay. But the region, the region is 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 hungry. That I can I can assure you. First of all, uh, population is growing. Then there's uh, effects of climate change as as hit so much of Sub-Saharan Africa. So many countries. I mean, Sudan, Chad, parts of Kenya. They're not able to produce their own crops. I mean, I don't want to talk about the Congo because the Congo is just a hungry market. It's a huge, huge hungry market just near to us. Zambia is supplying all these markets, but they're failing to sustain them. So we're having customers coming as far as those countries wow. to come request for the products from, from us here. And you can only imagine just how much underserved these markets are. 
So that's why now at Wonder Farm, we're kind of like uh, innovating, trying to bring in a lot of new competencies in terms of equipment, uh, young, uh, dynamic people from universities and colleges joining us, you know, so we could, we, we could compete at, at a higher level. And you've also been doing tons of like capital investments that I've been following, just new buildings, new plants and equipment, machinery to, to really start scaling in the efficiencies of, of using some of these tools, which is, which is in, been incredible to, to follow your journey from afar. Yes. Yes. So there's been quite some growth in, in our activities and, you know, without investment, uh, then, then I think you see the system. You have to like innovate the whole time. Quite hard to to to, to get in terms of financing for what we do, especially for a business that is pro social. The social aspect of business is so huge. You know, I think it's kind of like it's, it's sixty forty. You know, economic could be sixty but forty. It's kind of like social and mostly, of course, it's that's so embedded. Like I said, we we don't give to charity. No, we, we're not giving out. Our business is dependent on the social aspect of it. Farmers have to be dragged into it. Probably trend, not at a cost. I mean, not, not at a cost to us, not to them, but the products that they produce is now what come, comes in to cover up for all the, our expenses and overheads. So we've been looking around for investments. A few friends that we were with in Bisco, sorry, probably you know, they might mention their names. If, if not, other people might pull that out. But then I kept Billy Crumble. I actually helped to fundraise for the training center that we currently are building. The training center, the idea we should actually, if you can look at the second slide, we should these 120 small other farmers or producing grains should continuously be coming in and out of that training center learning new old technologies or new techniques of farming. Farming has now evolved the aspects of climate change and we can't do it perpetually the odd way. We, we have to take care of ourselves. We, we have to manage the resources like water, flora and fauna, you know, all those are the huge aspects of, of, of the farming. The issue of what if every seed of maize you plant, then you can also plant a tree, just decide to read, you know, and, and, and what if we stepped out of check or burning uh, and, and make money or earn our living or, or transform our lives through sustainable agriculture than just cutting trees for charcoal and, and everything. And we, yet we can experience all these effects of climate change. So a training center is very vital for us. Yeah. Uh, suffice to say that also in the same facility, we are training ourselves to practice farming as a business because that is sustainable. And, 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 and appreciating the small pieces of land that we have and maximizing what we're producing from there. So you can see from the slide, currently we have a total of 720 smallholder farmers registered to supply us grains. Yeah. And at the bottom there, you can see a hundred of them contracted to supply us small livestock. So for, the idea is to have these farmers come into our facility, which is a main hub. They come in with their grains and small livestock. And, and, and our job is to make sure we are buying it from them, but we're also buying it from them as organized groups, because we're also trying to just create relationships with people. We are also trying to just strengthen families and, and the structures that exist in that community. So we become a recognized team that is working together, putting our efforts together to grow that community where we, we all belong. So Wonder Farm is bringing in revenues in that community, buying from these organized groups. And then we create, the plan is to create bigger storage and collection points in terms of silos, cold chain system, and, 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 and feed loads. Going forward, the plan is to make sure that no raw material leaves a community where we are operating from, which has uh, over 3,000 smallholder farmer households. Like everything that is produced there is, 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 is value added within there and then to the uptown market, we are taking a finished product and, and also farmers don't have to labor to look for market. Wando itself should be a primary market and, and there's nothing that is more exciting when you know that what you're producing, there's already somebody waiting to, 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 to take it, you know? And you and know like, the price generally where it's going to be. So you know what inputs you can put in and you know that you're, you're not going to lose money because you have a, a, a guaranteed buyer in yourself and Wando Farms. 
definitely, definitely, definitely. Okay. So, and, and then the other part, like I mentioned earlier, is to make sure that we're also equipping these teams with financial skills. We, 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 we make people understand how to just operate with a business sense on, on the land that, that stays, you know, so developing their financial skills, but also respecting the fact that we, we have to protect and take care of the environment in which we operate. You know, farmers have to actually have a sense of passing on the land they are tilling today to, to their grandchildren and their, 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 their many grandchildren that are going to come after them. So then how does that happen? Only if we can take care of the land. Uh, God, God stopped making land a long time ago. So if you mess the land that you have now and it's not able to give you anything, especially if you depend on it for your life, what happens, you know? Yeah. So, so you're, sense. you're increasing the fertility of the soil as well than just like the, the slash and burn farming that's, that's happening in other places maybe. Yes. Yes. And, and, and also just trying to take ourselves off the hook of sustaining the fertilizer industry. You know, much of our fertilizer is, is coming from the States. And, and if you check, you will, you will, you will, you'll come to realize that most of the people there don't even use those fertilizers. They just make it for these markets here. Most of them are eating healthy now and they're trying to heal their, their land by, by going organic. Of course, it's difficult to, 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 to go organic in, 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 in the countries and, and communities where there's food insecurity, like, like here, but, but, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a two way thing here. You want the quick fix and then lose it all going forward. Oh, you know, at the end of the day, it's also just our own health because at Wonder Farms, we demonstrated that the same grass that we keep burning as communities in seasons like this time, now when it's dry, everybody wants to burn the grass and the leaves. We're saying, look, this can be converted into compost and look at how your crop will look like. So imagine this grass and then the fertilizer, which you are going to buy at a very exorbitant price because fertilizer is very cheap. I mean, very expensive. Yeah. yeah especially right now it's gone up tremendously yes. with the, the cost of natural gas and things like that. Yes. So do we choose to stop eating because fertilizer has gone up or we can work with things that we have within our, ourselves, you know? So nature just has its own way of balancing up things and, and, and we have things that we're just wasting and, and, and they are the solution and it's cheap to use those and to rely on the fertilizers. Okay. So let me just quickly run through. Please. So at the main hub, like I said, which is at Wonder Farm facility, apparently, so we have two sites now, we got blessed. We managed to find another 20 hectares. Uh, the fully developed one is at 10 hectares, but now we have a 20 hectares. That, that's why we're doing value addition processes. So we're doing also bulk handling those facilities. We're going to have a cold chain soon. Now we're doing some installations. And trade transactions, farmers are welcome every day. They are walking in and out of our facility, transacting with our team, striking deals, the, the, the joining in supply chains and coming in for literacy and farming as a business trainings. And then we've created satellite hubs. These are happening at the community level where now the farmer cooperatives and women and youth groups. I've set up their own committees and selected their own leadership structure. At that level, they are aggregating whatever they are growing themselves. Okay. Of course, meeting our standards and quality based on the trainings that they're receiving. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're doing quite quite quality control at their level. Okay. And then we are also selling them our finished product, mostly feed and some inputs that includes vaccines for, for livestock and treatments. And then we are also doing trainings at that level and also monitoring their, 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 their input after the trainings. That place also is a collection and transportation point for, for what is aggregated from these small, small order farmers. So things are brought there, then we send our own transport to go and collect merchandise to bring to the main facilities at Wonder Farms. Then we are also operating at the footprint level. This is where the farmer is mostly at their field or small wedding level. So the farmers there are producing the desired products that we require, which I'd mentioned earlier, like beans, soybeans, maize, sunflower, pigeon pea, and some livestock. And then the trading continues. This, this, we are following them. They are coming in to meet us. So we are bulk handling. We're doing value addition. And then we are taking to the uptown market. 
after a market, very challenging for a smallholder farmer. The language changes when they go there. There are people that are, you know, manipulating the smallholder farmers. The time that smallholder farmers are also getting stuck with their produce. Imagine you 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 you, you have your chicken and then you're taking it to a market that you don't even understand. You can only get what exploitation will be like, oh, yeah. and and sometimes farmers get to to be ignored for two or three days in a market that they don't know. They don't even have a place to stay and, and the chickens start to lose weight because the manipulator just wants a farmer to give up and sell them at their price. That is different from how we are operating. We are in the village with them. We are discussing the markets together with them. We're exposing them to different technologies. We are able to open up the internet sites where they can check things. Just the markets. Check the, the prices weather. and everything. Yeah. Yes. You know, so that is what we bring in. So at Wando Farms, we are stock purchasing, we are value addition, value adding. We are acquiring customers and conducting business transactions. We are promoting conservation farming and livestock production and management. Of course, the aspect of flora and fauna, we can't leave it out. We want people to respect the environment in which they operate. Otherwise, everything that we're doing come 10 years will crash. Okay, and there's sours. If we're not giving them, they'll not give us back. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what we give them is not synthetic fertilizers and chemicals now. Of course, for now, we're insisting on sustainable use. And if we can slowly start to wean ourselves of the dependence on chemicals and fertilizers. Okay. And, and Wonder Farm is providing the evidence that it can work with the local resources that we have. If you're a farmer, you've got cattle, you've got goats, you've got pigs. There's so much manure that is at your disposal. And that's yeah. what the soils currently require, not the synthetic fertilizers. And and I, I, this is something I was really interested in getting into with you as well, is because right now we're seeing a global shortage in food, and it obviously <laughs> falls on to the poorer nations more than others. And the inputs of like the fertilizer, the prices are going way up. And then you also have the inputs of a lot of the seed companies now are trying to create seeds that don't create their own seeds. So you have to keep going back to the seed bank. And so then you, uh, the farmer can lose control that way. And then the other thing is like the pesticide. They, a lot of these seeds have been modified so you can spray pesticides on them. It'll kill everything except for that seed. But then that pesticide is going in water. And, and uh, some people think that even within the seed, it could be a, you know, a little tough for people. But at the, at the same time, it has shown that it's produced surplus food. So I'm, I'm just wondering like how, how you're kind of handling that balance. You know, the, the industry is, is very, very, very powerful. The cartel. The seed, yeah. seed industry and the fertilizer industry is very, very powerful that they managed to manipulate our systems and governments, you know, because previously, honestly, the smallholder farmers had their own seed banks. Now they are even trying to criminalize the aspect of you replanting from your own bank because now they're trying to accuse smallholder farmers of bringing in food insecurity because they're saying now you don't even produce enough because you're not working with hybrid seeds. You know, but how did it happen in the past? You know, it's only now actually that we, we, we're more hungry because in the past we were not, we weren't this hungry. We are more hungry now. Okay. It's like a farmer has to spend every little that they make. The, the industry just wants to make sure a farmer spends every little penny that they make. You have to buy the fertilizer. You have to buy the seeds and you have to buy the chemicals to spray your crops. How much is that? You know, so our smallholder farmers completely operate in a negative, even before they start to, to, to plant and harvest, they're already in negative because the cost of production is so, so high and they don't get to rip anything out of it. It's more of just growing crop and, 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 and livestock out of pride, you know, because you are just used to doing that, but do you know how much you're making besides the, the, the fine issues that are going into there. Do you know how much time you're putting in? Do you know how much you're ripping off? Do you know how much you, you're able to harvest off a one hectare? Are you able to measure all that? You know, and all the time we've tried to uh, do these calculations with our farmers, we're realizing that actually they are better off in the negative and, and it's as good as stopping this. Of course, the argument is 
uh, you know, let me continue to grow so that I can feed myself. And then what happens to you know the other things like your health? How do you pay for those? Yeah. Uh, how do you send your kids to school? You know, so the seed and, and uh, fertilizer industry has seriously, seriously disadvantaged. I would say Africa. I'm working with smallholder farmers and I can see. That's why it, it has now become even a political tool to supply, subsidize <laughs> fertilizers and seeds in Zambia to farmers because then they, they know that's the only way they will sustainably grow from themselves and the governments know that's the only way they'll get a vote, you know, but look, it's not sustainable for everybody. Nobody wins. You're just closing and only the industry that's supplying these things is winning, you know. And, and growing in strength. The cartel is growing in strength while strangling every independent producer. Yes, definitely. Yes. And, and that is where we come in as Wonder Farm at all, very smallest level, just try to bring in these realities to, to our small order farmers, besides also just, you know, them messing up their own cells that surely will be of no use in the coming few years because of just this over-dependence on these chemicals and fertilizers, which the same manufacturers themselves don't even use in their own countries, you know, so. And supply chains, yeah, are afraid over the last three years, especially. So yeah. ha yeah. having that independence, and it's almost like you're creating a blueprint for what can happen. So in, in some ways, so much of farming in the world has been so centralized and because of efficiency and because of the cost of capital and everything else, but it is not very strong. It's not very resilient if there's any issues in that centralization. But if you had a more decentralized, many different farming communities like you're doing right now, all over Zambia, all over Africa, you have a, a food security almost that, you know, Thomas Sankara was trying to do in Burkina Faso, where it's just like, you have the land, you have the people, if, if you can just get it all organized, which it, it's really, you know, hats off to you for, for moving this forward. Very, very, very true. Very true. I mean, we, 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 we have the land here and we have a very cheap labor among us families. You know how Africa was even families. One household would have close to eight and 10 people living in there. And, 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 and mostly they have um, no any other job apart from just tilling their own cells or, or tendering their own uh, livestock. That gives them, that gives us very cheap labor uh, within ourselves, you know, and, and, and if we can start to grow whatever we consuming and, and also selling out at a very affordable, in a very affordable way, a very cheap uh, the production cost, then that's where sustainability is. But if we would have the cheap labor, we have all this land, but then we are relying on these imports, which are very, very expensive, then surely the anger that you keep hearing of in Africa, I mean, you'll never be eradicated. So we have something that is so significant to us. So that is the land, you know, but look for us to till that land, you know, for us need to tools, to yeah, you need machinery. You need we an educated much. population to figure out how to, to work it. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of difficult to strike that, strike the balance, but, uh, you know, as, as Wonder Farms, the, 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 the aspect of just talking about it, uh, trying to enlighten communities for us already is a great success. Also suffice to say that issues of climate change are still uh, issues of, of, of very far away in our, in our people. They, they, they still have to understand where that is and, and, and governments like here are not doing enough, you know, to, to, to support or to promote or to bring in information at the level where the impact is felt the most, you know, when you talk about climate change, it's only ending in boardrooms and, and, and international conferences by politicians and it's not trickling down to this actual land chiller. The person who's actually cutting down the trees, the, who only thinks charcoal burning is their own livelihood, yeah. you know, it's, it's not getting down to them. Uh, it's just people at that high level. And discussing. what alternative do they have other than charcoal? You know, if you don't have another alternative, people yes. aren't going to starve, you know, they're yeah. going to choose to do whatever they can to, to survive. Yeah. So, so it's not trickling down. So if we could trickle it down in, in a small initiatives, like we're trying to do ourselves, because we are working directly with his, with his families, smallholder families. And of course, you know, it's, it's an issue of 
convincing people with proper evidence that actually, you know, we can grow maize and the tree side by side, you know, and, and what does that call for? That calls for a lot of innovation on our side as a small business that is, that is trying to probably see if we could help at our smallest level, change the status quo. We, we might not change 1 million people. You know, we might change 20 people, uh, but 20 people are, are coming from homes where there's probably eight of them, you know, and, 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 and if they can sustainably work on their land and, and, and follow those principles, you know, who knows what would happen five, five, 10 years from now, if the children coming can understand all these principles and we start to protect the environment, while we also make good use of the land that we accept feeds us. Yeah. You know, because we don't, there's no industry in Zambia. There is no industry. And, and, and the industry you talk of in Zambia, most of it is owned by foreigners. And there are a few of them, and they will not manage to employ everybody. Okay. And, and then, uh, you know, when it's foreign owned, then probably most of um, the profits are externalized. They're not yeah. in, your, in your local economy. So Wonder Farm is coming in trying to do all these many things. It's saying, okay, let's create an industry. You know, we are, we are a local face. Let's create it. Not very easy. Not very easy. Very tough undertaking. You, 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 even very lonely in most cases, because you, we, 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 I require a lot of competent skills. I, I need a lot of innovative young people coming in from universities and colleges, but how do I pay for them? Yeah. The, uh, business is still in its growth stage. So the idea yeah. is so huge. It's so yeah. huge and so beautiful, but. You know, to, to support it, it's, it's a lot of work. The little profits you make here, you want to pull the community and, and make sure that you don't leave them behind. Yeah. And, you know, so it's, it's all that. And, and that is where you, you see most of the time I'm, I'm, I'm requesting people with expertise to come and volunteer for, 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 for us. So we're having many people coming in from Europe, coming to, to you know, bring in their skills. And, 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 and see how we could just leverage on, on their knowledge and, and coming from quite established uh, economies, uh, trying to, trying to help us is yeah. quite challenging. Yeah. So uh, with the remaining time we have left too, and, and we're running out of time, but I, I'm also interested in infrastructure because agriculture obviously needs water and needs electricity. It needs transportation. Yeah, we can keep going through some of these slides as well for, for where, where you're going next. That, that's the other side is like how to get financing, the government to get financing, and that can help improve. And the fact that you brought the transformer to your community to get electricity off, you know, off the grid, that, that obviously probably is an essential part of it because you're also using it for pumps and you're using it for a lot of different things for, for irrigation. But what I, I know that was one of the challenges when I was there and I presume it still is. I mean, even in, in the U.S., which once had great infrastructure, we, many of the political leaders have been neglecting it for, for many decades now and things are starting to fall apart here. So what, what is kind of the plan on, on the infrastructure? Are you in, in touch with politicians at all? Or is it just, because I know a lot of balance of payments are just, everything's in the red almost everywhere around the world these days. That's a very good question. Actually, if, if I was in touch with politicians, probably I would have uh, maybe grown so quickly within a short period <laughs> of time. And I would, I would have actually been shut down by now because I would have got it in trouble. Uh, no, we... Not necessarily working with politicians, but uh, Wonder Farm is a compliant business. Everything we do is a conformity with the law. Uh, we, we registered with all quasi-government um, institutions that manage or regulate certain aspects of what we do. That is the only level probably we are at. If you say politicians, we, we work with just with the government, but there's no... Uh, aspects of us getting favors and no, uh, it's actually not even in my um, business interest to uh, first be political because uh, I am not political. Uh, and parties um, change. <laughs> so, I, am, yeah. I, am, I am more socialist and level of poor people. I think that's where everything works with me. Macho, the support that has come to Wonder Farms at inception mostly was just from family and friends. Like I said, I stepped out of work 2015 
And most of what I did was just to, to borrow around from the family and friends. When times were hard, like every business, I would let go of some, some, some properties that I was holding on to. I, 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 I sort of, like you just that I had, which I end was working. I, I thought I didn't need it anymore. And I did have a car, uh, just to, to bring electricity to the village. But of course, I think my instincts told me it's, it's going to be better where we are headed. So we needed to have the power come. And, and then I, I did get exposed to donor support through government line ministries. People got to know what we were doing and they, they linked us up to support agencies, Market Connect. There's an organization called Market Connect, which is supported by the World Bank. They, they did get to hear of us, came, did their due diligence. And actually, if I was even connected to politicians and not been a good citizen as a business in this country, they wouldn't even have supported us. So when they checked and found who was just the family that was working so hard and trying to create opportunities, they thought they could help us with equipment only. So they, they supported us with coaching, part of the coaching that we are installing right now, and also the code room and the transportation. We are yet to receive a refrigerated truck to just help move the products, products around. Uh, and as if that wasn't enough, the need Finnish Minister of Foreign Affairs also uh, got to hear what we're doing. And then they also sent in a team that checked and we are certain we, what we say we are. And they're the ones actually that have got us the slot, which is actually game, a game changer for us because once we commission the levels of production, actually for livestock will be so high that we'll be able to even start to reach the regional market. Of course, uh, friends from uh, Pisco, Kelly and, and Anna also came in and they helped push us bit on the construction of a training center. And of course, we haven't yet finished it. We didn't manage to raise enough, but at least we've gone to a level where the next phase, if we were able to find some financing, just to roof and put all the fittings so that farmers now would have their own place to report for trainings. Right now, we tend to use different rooms for training. We put them in our processing room and yeah. things like that. Yeah. yeah. Having your own classroom will be a game changer, I'm sure. Definitely, yes. Yes. So I hope I answered that now, no political inclination. Yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we don't intend to, to be political in what we do now. So is this the next slide, the maturity steps of Blondo Farms? Is that kind of your, your next step for going forward? Next steps? So basically, this is just what our plan look like. So for year one and two, at least we managed to secure land, connect to electricity grid, put up water articulation systems. And then year three to four, we're thinking of expanding. Of course, expansion is coming in the form of upgrading of the infrastructure where we, we operate. We're not so much in a hurry to get outside of Osaka, not until we package everything that we, we're doing very well and can easily replicate it. But the process itself is kind of, I, I think. It, it, to other people like yourselves, you might think we moved a bit faster from zero to where we are in seven years. I'm thinking we're slow. I'm kind of an ambitious person and, and a bit stubborn, like my wife, my wife will say, if I need to do something, I, I, I you know, I, I <laughs> focus on it. So, but I, I, I otherwise year five, six, uh, everything being equal, we gain our traction. We want to take our activities in most rural parts. Of, of the country. On the finance and admin side, definitely we need to make the money. We don't um, necessarily believe in charity. That's why even with the farmers that are working with, we, we, we want to actually insist on aspects of transacting with them. You bring us a product, we buy it from you at an acceptable price. We, we want this, give you a, of course, we, we, we force or deliberately uh, set up a fund that supports certain kids with their education. We have one blind boy now is in his high school that we adopted quite young. We support the local health center with, with fuel during the promotion of mother to child uh, health programs. That is not so much outside our core business because we know if we have a healthy community, then all these farming activities, you know, will work well. If, if HIV and the AIDS will be an issue in the community or just easily treatable diseases that become so 
trouble, tr troublesome in our community, then most of our farmers will stay at home or they'll be attending funerals, then the business gets affected. So when we participate in some of these, maybe not so core functions like promoting health issues and supporting the local health center, it still has a huge effect on the end result at our business. And, and, and the kids going to school or kids that are now like a support, school support system, we know eventually a lot of skilled young people in the village would add up to our workforce because we don't outsource much of a workforce. If we can also just harvest from the village where we're operating, then, then, then we're happy. So we need it, it on its money. Wando Farm is looking for partners. We, we, we check, we chase it for soft loans if we can. Loans because they are payable. We, 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 we have to pay back. If we can find investors that would love to come in support what we do. The word is, you know, we are, we are a local a company. We are a local company that when you support it, you, every, everything stays within, within here. And so we, we want to grow. Desire is big. And I think our intention is very clear. Well, the question would be. Why can't you get local financing? You know, I would, I would be happy to step into the bank because the bank is willing to, to, to support us. But interest rates are so high in Zambia, talking about at 6 to 8%. And then the pay, pay, payback period is kind of short. And of course, we have the service, but we will also doing a lot of infrastructure development that take a bit of time to, to, to mature. So we kind of hesitant to get, get to the banks uh, because of that, that reason. And that's why for a long time, we've just grown our business organically and like, and like depending on the, 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 the banks, but also the social aspect of a business, you know, it's, it takes in a lot of people that we don't have much control of. So I wouldn't want to borrow and put one of them at risk. Uh, yet I can't control all the almost 1,000 farmers that we are depending on. People being what we are, yeah. others who choose to trade, sell, you know, so there's kind of that risk. Not until we we grow our systems, so we bring in a team of competent people and, 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 and grow just a team to help me organize and manage this whole thing. I, I also want to say that advanced education and knowledge and minds and, and innovations are more into the America and the West. And, and I want to invite just young people, you know, that want to come and experience Africa, you know, they are happy to give their time, the services, you know, it could be three months, it could be a year, it could be more. But Wonder Farm has all those opportunities. You, you can come and, 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 and gain some, some, some experience. It is culture wise and, and, but you bring in that knowledge that this economy greatly desires. And, and we are dealing with people that mostly have, didn't have the privilege of sitting behind a desk and, and learn. And, and, and we are not going to throw these people away. No, as for Wonder Farm, we depending on them, we want to do business with them. So bring in your knowledge, bring in, bring in, bring in your expertise and then once we give you an experience of our culture and I would assure you I would also make you see the animals Zambia's got beautiful tourism <laughs> at my expense I promise yeah. that I would do my expense so come in and, and then team up with us and, and see what we can do together to just make sense of what we try to do as Wonder Farm as a person and as a family I feel we have set up the best and we can't go it alone and we are not just like profit centric family now. We want to work with, with, with families and, and, and help see if we can transform lives. Besides everything else, we have the, the customer who brings in money into our business and, and we have to make sure that we are producing quality food for this customer. It's not easy for people to spend money on you. There's so many places they could spend their money on, but if they choose one of them, we should make sure that we give them quality food, but which is produced in a very sustainable manner. Okay. While taking communities along with us. So Linda and me will never, if we have extra change and we feel you can buy jewelry, we would rather give somebody else a job or, or send an extra kid to school. 
So we love to just uh, pull the communities uh, with us. And the next slide, if you can see, this is just a part of the pain points as to why we are, we, we joined in this industry. You know, I did talk about uh, almost 90% of the, the farmers are the ones that produce what we eat, you know, what we consume in this country. And then and, and besides all this, these farmers are still living before the poverty line. And why is that? We've taken up the labor to try to educate each other with the farmers on how we can change our lives. You know, so, and we can also see next point, uh, a lot of Zambians are also becoming cautious of what they're eating. You know, uh, the middle class in Zambia is, is coming up now and, and people want to know what is it they, that they're eating and how is it being produced, you know, and then wonderful is saying, what can we do differently? You know, uh, and uh, we are also saying, uh, well, half of an average Zambian household has meat every day on their plate. You know, very few can, can, can say where it was produced and how, you know, and so we're trying to be so transparent in what we do. We, we invite people into our facility. They get to see how we work. We take them into communities. They interact with the farmers. Sorry, if this just run away. So this is just our solutions. Uh, so this is now just anchored for the customer now. Uh, the, the, this presentation is mostly just for the customer mm -hmm. and we are asking the customers that we want them to eat what they can trust. You know, so many diseases now that people get to wonder why they're getting so, so sick. Yeah, for you sure. Know, you got to know, know where your know food that? comes from. Yeah, the food shouldn't be your poison. No. And that's what wonderful is also telling his customers. Food is supposed to be our medicine. You know, so you can see a second point there where I'm talking about training and I'm handshaking a very old lady, but she passed on three months ago, but she was a client that I did business. And this was after making a payment to her, it's surrounded by her grandchildren, you know, after training the maintenance income coming into, into the family, you know, the third one there is just uh, insisting on how we are promoting conservation agriculture, land tillage. We are not damaging the soil structures and we are training. These are part of the people of the family that we've trained and they're producing a crop to supply us, you know, so that's a zero secular system that we are promoting at household level, you know, but yes, we've got some traction and we make money as a, as a business. You can see otherwise, if we're not making the money, we would have actually stopped. It should have been a shower of time. I would have been looking for a job. I would have been waiting for my years. So I think Africa also in Zambia yeah, is seriously a very big open market. There's so much opportunity. And it's entrepreneurs like ourselves, local entrepreneurs, trying to take advantage of these opportunities. For a long time, we've always thought it's, you know, the foreigners, especially from China and India, that we thought are the only ones that can industrialize this country. You know, and people come in 10, 15 years and make their money, they are gone, you know, and, and, and I've taken up the initiative with my wife to just create an industry also, but that respects the local laws that drugs the community along with it, you know, that is, that is our plan. So this slide just talks about attraction that we have and our girls who are going up. These other ones just talks about our impact in their community. It's job creation on top there. You can see it's a training that we're running for smallholder farmers. So that's so we do it. When this training is happening in our feed mill plant. So we have switch up machines when we have trainings, not until we finish the training center, then we'll be meeting in our training room. So we're creating jobs. You know? uh, right now we know that over 1,400 direct and indirect jobs have been created. And then we, we check how much we're spending in our supply chain. And then we see different people coming in and our database is showing that actually figures just, just improving. And the, the last picture there is one, just one good example of what happened to one old man who became our, our customer and was supplying us before that's a house he lived in. You know, now you can see the new house is built for himself and his family. It's that's, incredible. Yeah. That the impact of us doing business with this community. And then when we said transforming lives, we are transforming lives in a business sense, not through aid. No. Yeah.
Otherwise, I have explained more of this model in my this, the previous charts. So currently, like I told you, we need to produce uh, 12,000 pigs a year to pass through the equipment we are currently installing. And 50% and of that have to come from the farmers. And you know, when that's that big opportunity for them, it's revenue, it's jobs for them and their children. Okay, so the farmers are expected to raise these animals. Okay, we will supply them with the best breeders, we'll give them the feed and the technical, technical support. And technical support, like I was saying, can come from anywhere. It can come from within here, yeah, from the US, from Europe. I open it and I'm ever chasing for people, inviting people to just come and bring us the knowledge. I believe so much in knowledge. You know? That exchange is so important. Yeah, and, and at the footprint level, you know, it's not just contract farming, it's relationships. We are respecting people. You know, we, we do not just transacting now, we are getting relationships with, with people and, and we are watching lives change together. Okay. So our market mostly is in the Meron and, and the blue. That's where most of our market is. Okay. And you can see those combined, we have about 73% of market opportunity to exploit. So. We've, we've already tested these markets. We just need to grow as a business and, and then make sure we bring in the right competencies in terms of equipment and skills. And I would, I would bet you in the next 10 years, we'll be a business to, to work on with. Nice. Yeah. Uh, just as I end, that's just for the team that is uh, actively working, working with us. That's Linda. You remember her. Oh yes. Oh yes. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, Bruce and Shobo. So the so we have Peter David, who is more like an external. He's animal nutritionist. He's the one who does feed formulations for us. His company supplies us uh, ingredients to make sure that it's a quality feed that that we are producing. And he comes to check on our animals, and he helps to design also community trainings on animal production. But he's more of external. And Michelle just left recently. He came, he could have posted a bit of him. He came from the Netherlands and he has agreed to be around and support us for as long as he's actually contemplating even retiring now in his job just to also concentrate on, on trying to, to assist us with our work. That's uh, incredible. And there, I don't know if you've been following the farmers protests in Netherlands right now, but there's been a huge protest movement of farmers in the Netherlands because they're government's trying to prevent the use of fertilizer and it, it is creating revolt. So <laughs> you make it more Dutch farmers down in Zambia. <laughs> yes, yes. And you can see also in our team, very uh, badly, we even have an environmental technician is making sure we, when we say we got to protect the environment, we have, we bring in even people to spearhead that cause, which is not quite attractive in Africa. People don't want to spend money on things to do with the environment and, uh, you know, but for us, no, it's, it's so key. The last gentleman there is in charge of our development, designing also just training programs. So basically, yes, of course, this was just a presentation. I was uh, trying to raise money somewhere else. So maybe that's how you were seeing those figures, but this is what we've done. We've been able to grow the crop. We have raised and invested those many dollars from our own, the, the, capital from within here, funds that we borrowed that start from family and friends. Those are the only loans that we acquired. Then we started to sell our products, made a bit of profit, paid back our loans, but about 326,000 is gone into our investment books. There's currently an audit going, so I'm even told it's now more than that because of the new investments. So we're kind of like trying to raise 200,000, mostly for amazing financing. And also we would want to get an investor who will not just probably come in to support what we do, but they also give in their time, they get involved in what we do, you know, bringing the expertise and, 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 and knowledge. That's, that's, that's basically what is, what is attracting us and why do we need the money? So we're saying, look, we seem to be a, a family that feed the future in, in our country. You know, a small level, but what we're doing surely is, 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 is good, good evidence that it's working very well. First, creating jobs, you know, supporting our local economies and taking care of our environment. Okay. 
So we want some investments that will help us increase on our breeder head size for the animals. You know, we can't get big farm and our 60 breeders, that is just a female head. That's what we counted as our stock because the other animals are in and out. So 60 is kind of our breeding stock and we want to raise that to 250. And, and that would be a lot of jobs for young people and women if we did that. Then we also want to scale up on our soda capacity from 50 pigs to 1,000 pigs a month. Wow. Because now we have the equipment to support the slaughter. And then also building a housing facility for a slaughter line. Of course, where through our profits, we have now a warehouse. It's kind of like just slow to finish it up. There is a lot of civil works I need to do in there, but mostly I'm depending on just profits that we are getting and it's taking us a bit of time to finish that. We also want to increase our suppliers in the outgrower scheme from 705 to at least 1,500 smallholder farmers. Basically, I think that that would be, that would be all. That's just, I think our summary and our team and just how we interact with my team and just trying to think through of how can we innovate the whole time? We are an eco employer, and besides starting as a family business, we we want everybody to participate, and we we'll now open it up to people getting shares if they want. You know, like getting just... equity as a part of it. Awesome, yeah. It's just an incredible operation that you going got going on. I can't imagine the thousands of hours that you put in to make it happen, and the, all the heartache and pain and taking the L's and still come in and still marching forward and still, still moving ahead is so incredible to see you doing this Conrad. So one of the final questions, I guess, what gets you, what keeps you motivated? What inspires you? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Interesting question idea. You know, let me that, answer it hypothetically. Uh, I, I'm not sure of how much you've read the Bible, but I'd love to just browse through the pages just for some knowledge. Uh, two people lived then. There was uh, Lazarus and the rich man. I'm not sure that story might sound familiar. But apparently, the rich man was, was extremely wealthy. And Lazarus stayed at his doorway every day begging for, for food crops that fell off his table. I, I, can't, I don't know how many years that is when that happened. But up to now, we don't even know the name of a rich man, but we know of Lazarus, the poor man. We're able to call him by name and we can't call the rich man by his name because we don't know him. Significance, I think, makes me wake up every day. How am I of significance or how am I of signif significant to the person who is not myself? And I create jobs that are really tough to do. Better off do a business, two or three of you, and, and everything is just anchored around you and it's easier that way. But not when you're trying to drag the whole community with you. It's, it's, it's very complicated. Com com communities make me wake up every day. And it, it gives me great joy seeing a family succeeding to produce a product and, and tender it in for cash at our facility. And then they go back to roof their house, build a house, a good house for themselves. And I see their kids go to school every time I'm driving for work to the facility and I'm seeing a lot of children go to school. And, and I know some of them because I see them come to get feed from our facility with their bicycles. So communities give me the energy to wake up and, and of how significant am I to them? really matters what difference they might bring in because I live today. What difference am I bringing to society, into people's lives because I'm alive today? That, that makes me want to live bad and, 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 and keep pushing. It's not, it's not, it's not creating um, the business I got involved in just transformed everything about me. I think, I think the time we worked together young and in those communities and everything was more like a stepping stone because this was going to come and, and I needed to be ready and, and, and I needed to see poverty at, at, at its best and very close and, and influence how donors should support those children without manipulating them or taking anything away from them. And, and then I think when nature saw I was ready, it put me at the point of 
responsibility and manage the direction and then the action and responsibility that will be taken every day. So significance would be my answer. Conrad, it is truly a pleasure of mine to have met you so long ago and to see you thriving and working with the community and lifting up the community around you. And I really hope to get to Zambia again in the nearer future. It's been way too long, but Conrad Boalia of Buando Farms, I'm going to put in the links and everyone should take a look at it and support Buando Farms. But thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it, brother. I greatly appreciate crossing you after so many years.